And so before we dive into tonight's uh, material, I just wanted to throw out an opportunity. Does anybody have any questions so far? If you were here last week, let me throw this out there first, that um, for the Wednesday night class that we're doing with the Book of Daniel, and even what Pastor Brian's class did, we are recording all of them and putting them on the YouTube channel for the church at Holly Community Church. So if you weren't here last week, you can watch the previous week and catch up. If you're not able to come the rest of the month, you don't have to feel like you're missing out because we're recording them. And we realize a lot of people, it's hard to commit to four Wednesdays in a row when you're already busy schedules. And so we sat back as a church leadership and said, hey, some people really want to tie into these classes but can't because of time. Well, we're using technology. And if you miss one, you didn't actually miss it because you can catch it on YouTube. And the Evan is so fast that he had it literally up the very next, actually, I don't even know if it was that night. He might have had it up. But he gets it up right away. You don't have to wait six weeks to do it. As long as our equipment doesn't break, okay, as long as it doesn't break, he has it up there pretty quick, okay? So we want to do that for you guys because we know some of it's like, ah, I can't be there. I missed out. No, you didn't miss out. And so um, you can tune in to YouTube there. And so we're going to dive in. But before we do, does anybody have any questions about anything we talked about last week? I may not have all the answers, but I'm willing to answer any questions you might have or moving forward. Nothing? 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 Nothing. All right. Let's dive in. Daniel chapter 2. Okay. And so if you remember from last week, we're getting into chapter 2. We're in verse 4. We're going to see verse 4 is where the text actually shifts to Aramaic. And that'll be Aramaic language all the way through chapter 7. And kind of remember some of the themes that we talked about last week, where we're going to see some heroic tales. We're going to see some people that are facing martyrdom. We're going to see some wisdom that God gives. And we're also going to see this apocalyptic um, writings, where God is revealing things at the right time to faithful individuals. And so keep all these things in mind, and also keep in mind the sub-narrative of Daniel, which is a clash between the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of man. And always keep that theme in the back of your head as you go through, because it'll really help you tie all of these pieces together. So let's read verse 1 of Daniel chapter 2. It says, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled. Anybody know where else you can find this story besides the book of Daniel of somebody that had this happen to them? Boom, boom. What's that? Yes, Esther could have a dream. There's another one. Joseph, yeah, yeah. So turn in your Bible to Genesis 41. So tonight, just like last week, we're going to be using the Bible. We're going to be flipping through it. We're going to be turning to different passages because it's important for us to be able to make these connections and see because these earlier writings should always be in the forefront of our minds. So Genesis chapter 41, okay? Um, I'm not going to read. There's 45 verses that I'm going to talk about. We're not going to read all 45. I'm going to point out certain verses of that 45 for us to catch on to. So, um, let me just read the first few verses here. After two whole years, Pharaoh did what? He dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. Okay? There's a dream. He reads through all the interpretations. He, reads, he gets through all the dreams. And verse 8, what does it say about Pharaoh here? So in the morning, his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men, Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. So again, you have the same scenario, the same setting. In Genesis 41, Israel is in captivity. They're in exile, like we talked about last week. They're living in a land that is not their own. They're living in Egypt. They have this wicked king who's ruling over them. This foreign king has a dream that was given to him by God, even though they don't know it's from God yet. And because of this dream, and because they don't know what it means, it troubles them, and they have to call for help. 
And in the exact same way, they call the magicians, the enchanters, these wise people who are supposed to be interpreting dreams. And so Pharaoh calls them out and says, can you please tell me what this means? Well, guess what happens to those magicians and enchanters? We don't know what it means. And so there's this one person in Genesis 41, the cupbearer, who said, man, I remember when I had a dream and couldn't interpret it. This guy, Joseph, interpreted it for me, and he told me I was going to be elevated back to my position, and he told the baker he was going to die. Man, you should go and talk to Joseph. And so Pharaoh calls in Joseph, and look at verse 15 in Genesis 41. It says, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And so here, even in Genesis 41, you see that man, the writer is trying to show us that man is limited in what they can do in this world. That up to man, man cannot rule this world. They think they can. They think they're in control. But men are mortal. We are flesh. We're created in God's image. We are not the center of the universe. We're not the most powerful beings in the world. And the author wants us to see no one can interpret the king's dream. There's no person. There's no man. And then Joseph replies to him the very next verse and says, it is not in me. What does he say? God will give Pharaoh an answer. And so I went through the rest of Genesis 41 and eight times, okay, look at what it says about God. So anytime in scripture, if you see things that are repeated, the author is telling you, hey, this is important. Pay attention. This is what I want you to get out of this passage. I want you to understand this thing. And so they keep repeating. Look at what verse 16 says, okay? Verse 16, it starts off, God will give. We just looked at that. Then you go to verse 25 where it says, then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one God has revealed. Then you go down to verse 28. You see God has shown. Then you get to verse 32, where these things are fixed by God. Then you get to verse 39. And again, you see God has shown. Then you get to verse 51, and you see God has made me forget, and then you get to verse 52, which says, for God has made me fruitful. So who's in control, according to the author? God. God is orchestrating all of these events. God is revealing. This is why Daniel is called, this is why this kind of writing is apocalyptic, because it is God revealing mysteries that are unsolvable by man, God is choosing to reveal his plans for the world to humans. Think about that. God in heaven, the creator of the universe, doesn't owe us himself. He chooses to reveal the truth to us, even to wicked kings, even to King Pharaoh, showing him, here's my plan. I have a plan that's going to go forth in the world. And this is what I am doing about it. And even reveals these things to men, to the good, and the unjust. So Pharaoh tells Joseph the dream. Joseph interprets that dream. And then what happens to Joseph? He's elevated to ruler in Egypt. And he's second in command. And all because God provided an answer to Joseph. And so when we read Daniel chapter 2, when we see the words that the king has a dream and his spirit is troubled, we are called to see that as an echo of scripture before. And remember last week we talked about that the writers, when they mention things that are found in other places in scripture, it is us for to remember those stories so we know how it worked out there in this place of scripture so that we have a greater understanding of, okay, here's what's going to happen here. When I see that this king had a dream and that he's troubled about it and there's no man that can answer it, I already know that the faithful God of Joseph is going to do something about the mystery here, that the same God who acted back then is going to act in the same way here. And so we already know God's orchestrating everything. But here we have King Nebuchadnezzar, 
this pow- most powerful king in the world right now is trying to set himself up as the greatest, as the best. But we already know from Genesis 41, only God is in control and only God can reveal mysteries. So here in Daniel 2, we already know the answer about what's to happen, right? We already have a heads up what's happening. So look at verses 2 through 11. We'll read them in Daniel chapter 2. It says, Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, and here's where we start the Aramaic text, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. Imagine you getting that job description from your boss. Here's what you need to do today. Tell me my dream, and if you don't, you're dead. Okay? This king has put an impossible scenario before his wise men. Like, this takes the story in Joseph and kicks it up a hundred notches. Because in Genesis, Pharaoh told Joseph the dream and told the magicians his dream. But here, King Nebuchadnezzar is saying, I'm not telling you the dream. You need to interpret it. You need to tell me the dream and then give the interpretation. Or you die. Now, if I'm a magician, and I'm not, I know I'm going to die, right? They know they're going to die. And look at what they say. Uh, I just lost my place. Here it is. Verse 6. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall show you and I shall, I'm sorry, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. The main difference between this and Joseph, I already mentioned, is Nebuchadnezzar keeps the dream to himself. Huge difference. And you can see the pride of Nebuchadnezzar coming out in this story. The reason why he doesn't tell them the dream is because he says, you have spoken lies to me before, which means he's probably had some dreams, asked them, and knows that they were not telling him the truth. And so to him, he sees it as a sign of disloyalty. He sees it as a sign of They're not telling him the truth, and so his pride here is causing him to give them this decree that, hey, at the end of the day, if you don't tell me what it is, you're going to die because he feels like his own magicians he can't trust. The the wise men, those who are the professors, those who have the answers to life's hardest questions, he doesn't trust them, and as a result, his only option would would be to kill them. And so he presents this scenario before his magicians, and they say, King Neb, there is no way that we can do this. It is not possible for anyone to do it. And then they make the declaration that not it, the only people that can do this are the gods, but they don't dwell with flesh. And so here we have King Nebuchadnezzar trying to elevate his kingdom trying to puff himself up to show himself as the greatest power on earth. And his people trying to respond to that by saying, look, King Neb, 
the only ones who can reveal things like that. It's not us people. It's gods. But your God, the gods that we serve, they don't have an interest with us. They don't dwell with us. They don't get involved with the affairs of man. And so this scenario, yes, with man, it is impossible. But what did Jesus declare in the New Testament? With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So in some ways, the magicians are right. It doesn't rely in man to give the answer. But their trust was in their gods and in the wrong view of a god because in their world, their gods didn't have anything to do with people on earth. And here's the reality. The most powerful king on earth has the wisest people on earth and they can't do what he has asked of them to do. The author wants us to see that the foolishness of man and the pride of man is what gets us into trouble. That we think we are wise in our own hearts and we're not. We're faulty. Our pride puffs us up. When we get knowledge, it goes to our head and we think that we don't need God because we're smart and we know more than God does. And it causes us to actually, it shows our weakness to realize that we do things. And we don't have all the answers and it shows our weakness. It shows that we are not like God in any stretch. And the wisest people in all the land have no idea what to do with King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. See, the gods in the ancient Near East had different views. We live in a world, and in Christianity, we know that we have a God who cares about us. We know we have a God who lives with us. But in the ancient Near East, their gods, yeah, they might have started the world, but that's about as far as they went into starting the world and getting things going. For their, for their gods, it was, we do two things. We make an image out of gold, metal, bronze, wood, whatever it is. We put it in a temple. We sacrifice to it. We offer incense to it. We worship that thing so that we can appease the gods. It's not built on a relationship. It's not built on uh, an interest where God actually wants to communicate with us and have this relationship that we have in Christianity. And so these gods are just offered to, so they just, they'll keep the rain coming. They'll keep the fields growing food. They'll provide for us because if we don't, then a God's going to get mad and he's going to bring a famine, he's going to bring destruction. And so we want to make sure we don't make them angry and then have to turn to us. So think about the gods they're worshiping. It's a non-personal God doesn't care about the lives of humanity. But see, God, the writer here, is putting the gods of this world up against the true God, the God of heaven, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not a God who's sitting on a cloud far, far away, caring about his world, and once in a while, flinging a lightning bolt down to earth. It's not what scripture tells us. It tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And goes on to say that the prize of its creation was humanity, where he made male and female, and he gave them a purpose. He gave them a vocation and said, I'm making you rulers over all this land. Look at my creation. You're to rule over it. You're to have dominion over the birds and the beasts and over every living thing, and you're going to reflect my praise and glory in all the world and back to me. You're going to be my people, and I'm going to be your God. And there was this relationship. Man sinned. And you would think God's at that time would have said, eh, God would have said, eh, all right, see ya, poof, lightning bolt, start over. But God didn't do that. God chose to intervene in the lives of man and woman. Yes, there was consequences to it, but he took Adam and Eve, kicked them out of the garden, placed them in the world, but told them, here are the things that I expect of you to do. And we see from that moment on, God intimately working with people that he has called out, separated unto himself so he can bless them, so he can love them, so that then they can take that message of this God to a lost world so that the nations could come to know God. This is an intimate God that the ancient Near East had no clue about. In their world, gods didn't care about what you went through. Just make sure you appease them. And so when we're looking at Daniel, Daniel, the author wants us to see the gods of this world, 
not that don't dwell with flesh. No, 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 no. Our living God, the true God, dwells among man. He cares. Think about it. It says, God created us in his image, right? God made a covenant with his people, right? God promises to never leave us nor forsake us. God is intimately involved in your life. And here we see in this story, God is setting King Nebuchadnezzar up to be humbled. And what we should read in this scenario is not just, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, he's a poor, evil man. When we read scripture, when the, when the Jewish people read scripture, it's to see ourselves in the same scenario as King Nebuchadnezzar. That the story of King Nebuchadnezzar is really the story of us all. I want what I want, how I want it, when I want it, and God, you can't tell me any different. From the moment we're born, our mentality is all about me. I'm the greatest being in the universe. So King Nebuchadnezzar, yeah, he was from Babylon, but it's also our story where we've sat back and we've put ourselves up and said we are greater than God and we are higher than God. And what has God done in our lives? I know what God has done in my life. The moments I thought I was king of the universe, he chopped me down like a cherry tree and humbled me. And when I gave my life to Christ, it's because he humbled me and said, this is not who you're meant to be. And so here King Nebuchadnezzar is about to be humbled, and we should know that based upon what happened with Pharaoh back in Genesis 41. So look at verses 12 through 16. He says, because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they, what, sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion. Now, where did Daniel get the prudence and discretion? From God, right? He was given all wisdom and knowledge. We saw that last week. So he was given this wisdom, and so he asked them, Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon, he declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. This is an echo of the cupbearer, right? Cupbearer, ah, there's Joseph. The people there, oh, let's go get Daniel. And Daniel's like, hey, what's going on here? And they tell him everything that's happening, and he immediately requests to go to the king. And they remember that Daniel was a man who had this wisdom from God, that, you know what, you're right. This guy, Daniel, has wisdom that is unseen anywhere else in our, in our nation, our country. We need to go to him and figure out if he has an answer to the dream. Look at 17, okay? It says, Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you for you have made known to us the king's matter. What was Daniel's response to finding out the king's dream. What was that? Praise him and thank them. But before that, before he got the answer, what did he do? To pray. You can write this down. Prayer is another main theme in the book of Daniel. And it's a main theme of people who are the faithful people of God. Faithful people of God are people who pray. And immediately, Daniel goes to his friends. Because remember, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And this is also an, uh, an echo of the book of Esther. Um, Ron mentioned it a few moments ago. 
when Esther decides she's going to step up to the plate and go before the king and spare her people, the Jews, what does she tell her friends to do? Go and fast, which means go fast and pray. And so this is an echo of scripture throughout all of God's faithful people. You can jump ahead on another time after tonight or wherever you want to do it on your own time, but go to Daniel chapter 9 and look at what Daniel does. He prays for his people. So in the book of Daniel, prayer is an important theme. Again, you're not going to see the word pray over and over, but it is a major theme of the faithful people of God because we all have to remember they're living in a place where it's in exile. They're living in a culture that is opposed to the true God. And we as the people of God are living in a society and a culture that is opposed to God. And how do we remain faithful to what God has called us to do? It's prayer. Prayer. Standing before God. Going to him with asking, God, give us wisdom. Help us to stand firm in our faith and not compromise, even in the face of someone who's powerful, even in the face of somebody who is wicked and has all the power in the world. Look at verse 19. Uh, we see this important phrase in 19 where the writer says, Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And the God of heaven is intentional. It is a direct contradiction of 2.11 where they're said that God does not dwell with flesh. That the God of heaven, the God almighty, this guy who has created all things, all powerful, he is going to reveal the answers. He is involved, and he has revealed this mystery to Daniel, that we have a God who's intimate with us. And then Daniel offers up this prayer of praise to God for delivering. And here's, here's the, when the magicians make this declaration that the gods don't dwell with flesh, we see that here Israel's God, the true God, he has all wisdom and might. He's the one that changes the times and the seasons. He's the one that removes and sets up kings. Here, King Nebuchadnezzar thought, it's all, my, it's all my military prowess that that's why I'm here at this point. And what we see here is, no, God has set up King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar didn't position himself. He sets them up. He takes them down. He gives the wisdom and knowledge to humans. He reveals himself to man. And here, he's going to give the answer. He's going to give the dream, and he's going to give the interpretation. So verse 24 through 30, this is where Daniel informs the king that he's got the answer, and we'll see how this plays out. Therefore, Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went in and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Now, Daniel could have immediately said yes, but what does he want King Nebuchadnezzar to know? He wants him to know the one true living God and look at how Daniel responds. No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the ver visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this, and he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. He makes it a special point. Was Daniel given the answer because Daniel was special? No. Yep. Yep, he loved God, prayed for him, gave him the glory. So why did God give Daniel the answer? What's that? Say that again. Exactly. You see, God doesn't choose people based upon their works and their efforts. It's based upon his perfect plan. 
God's plan all along was to make known to King Nebuchadnezzar, you're not in charge. You're not as high as you think you are. And so Daniel, yes, he was faithful. God will use faithful people to deliver his messages. Absolutely. But Daniel says, it's nothing I did. It's for your benefit, King Nebuchadnezzar, that I was given the answer. Because you need to hear this message from the living God. And King Nebuchadnezzar, once Daniel would tell him the dream, he would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the God of heaven, the God of Israel, has to be the living God because there's no way this man could know what I dreamt last night. And so Daniel tells him, look, this is for your benefit, not for mine. It's not for me to get glory. It's not for me to get praise. It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with you, King Nebuchadnezzar. The living God wants you to hear this. And I sat back this week as I studied that, and I found comfort in that. In the midst of my brokenness and rebellion, God spoke to me. And God chose to spoke to you. And God chose to reach you and to reach out to you. And God used people to do it for me. Took a cousin of mine to nag me and irritate me and beg me to go to church. And God uses people to speak to us. And so many times in life we can sit back and think, I'm all alone. God's left me. God hasn't been doesn't know what's going on, but you ever had somebody, you're in the middle of a day, and somebody comes and just says, hey, out of nowhere, and says something that just speaks to you, and it's like, how did you know? How, do, how does that happen? Because we have a God who loves you. We have a God who cares about you. We have a God who wants to speak the truth to you. And here, this is what happens to King Nebuchadnezzar. So, Daniel tells him that it's not anything he's done. But he wants King Nebuchadnezzar to know who really is the king of the world. And so God's, verse 28 mentions that God's plan for his chosen people is revealed in the last days. And he reveals mysteries and has shown what will be. We're not going to get into the last days now because that's a later part of the book. But there is wide debate on what the last days refer to. And so just keep that in mind that there are some that will say that the last days refers to the time when Jesus will come and rapture his church, take them up, seven years of tribulation. After the seven years, Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom. But there are other people, other Christians, other scholars who will say the last days refers to a time when Jesus destroys the temple, not Jesus destroys the temple, when the, this temple is destroyed, which happened in AD 70. And some will say those are the last days of this kingdom of the kingdoms of the world where the last days ended when Jesus established his kingdom which will never end and will last forever. So I say all that to say that there are different viewpoints and there's different sides, but no matter where scholars and people land on that side of the coin, they all love Jesus. And the point of this is not to know all the details. Jesus said that no man knows the day or the hour of when he's going to return. Not even Jesus himself knows, only the Father in heaven. So for any of us to declare that we know how it all is going to work out, we don't, okay? That's a foolish statement to make. But I'd say that to say that there's good people on both sides, no matter what. Because I've seen sometimes in churches and places where if you don't believe this about the last days, how can you be a Christian? But bad statement. That's not how God wants us to act. There's different views, good people on both sides who love Jesus, who are devoted to him, but we have to get into what is the text really wanting us to get out? Is the text really wanting us to figure out all the prophecy details to a T? Or does the writer want us to see the truth that Nebuchadnezzar is about to see? And I think as we stay focused on the text, the last days we can fill in. We can speculate. We can talk. We can theorize, which is all fun. They're great. It's great to do. But at the end of the day, what does God and the author want us to get out of this? So does that make sense? And we'll touch more on that at a different time. So look at verse 31 through 45. Here we get Daniel shares the king's dream and its interpretation. So he says, You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. 
Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the shaft of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory, and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all, you are the head of gold. Now, if you're King Nebuchadnezzar, you're feeling pretty good right now, right? I am. That's right. I'm gold. I'm the top. I'm the best. I have all the power. You're right. Keep going. So Daniel goes on. Another kingdom inferior to you shall rise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is are sure if you have the handout that i gave to you i want to look at this quote it's by dr john h selheimer and that's a lot of information a lot of details that we just read about the dream as well as the interpretation and i love what he says here and i apologize in my notes i have abbreviated king nebuchadnezzar to neb and i realized just now that i put neb on your paper so that was just me Abbreviating it, but anyways, it stands for Nebuchadnezzar. According to Daniel's interpretation, the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream was intended to represent the flow of events of human history up to and including the time when God would destroy all the kingdoms of the earth and establish his own eternal kingdom. Okay? You guys get what that means? In other words, that when the statue is finally destroyed, God's kingdom is coming to the earth. And when his kingdom comes, he will finally be king of the world, the universe, and his kingdom will be ruling the earth. It will no longer be man's kingdom ruling the earth. Even though men today think they're ruling the earth, even though men today think they're in charge, God's kingdom has come through Jesus' death and resurrection, and it is a kingdom that will never go away. He's reigning now. We're seeing lives change. People are giving their life to Christ because Jesus is Lord, and Jesus is King of kings, and in him is found salvation, is found forgiveness of sins, and this kingdom has gone forth. Like, we are sitting here today because Jesus' kingdom began, and it went from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth because his kingdom is unstoppable. And we're going to see in just a moment where this all unpacks from. But what we need to understand about King Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel, and there's people that have different views, but what I would say here is that we have to keep in mind is that King Nebuchadnezzar is representative in this story, in Scripture, as being representative of all human kingdoms. That what he is displaying, what he is portraying, he is representative of every godless kingdom that has ever lived on the face of this earth. That this is how they act. It's about their pride. It's about what they built. And if you don't do what we say, what happens? You die, right? And that's what human kingdoms do. We threaten people with death if you don't do what we like. If you do what we like, we spare your life. If you don't do what we like, you die. And evil empires, evil countries, evil kingdoms, 
they use death as a tool to get people to have loyalty. And this is representative of Babylon. It's representative of all kingdoms of the earth. But if you look at verse 36 through 38, their author does something that is very unique. He makes a reference to another place in scripture. So he says, You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God have of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory. And it goes on to this, And into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. Where do we see the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens making you rule over them all? Does anybody know? Yeah, go back to Genesis 1, 26. Okay, go back to the beginning of scripture. And this is why I would say I feel this is most correct to say King Nebuchadnezzar is representative of all kingdoms. And in Genesis 1, 26, God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them, and guess what? And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heaven, and over every living thing that moves on earth the earth. So what's, what is happening? Why does the author mention this? Because it's a representation. Man from the beginning was given the job to rule over God's creation. But what did we do instead? We rebelled against God and did what we wanted. We were supposed to rule over it under God's authority, rule under it under the ways that God had called us to live. And so King Nebuchadnezzar, the author throws this in there about the beasts of the field and the birds of the air for us to see, look, he is a representative. Just like Adam and Eve failed to live that out, they're supposed to be ruling as kings in creation, and they blew it. They messed it up. Here, King Nebuchadnezzar is the height of pride. He's the height of the kingdoms of the world. He's representing the blasphemy, the rebellion, the utter fist in the face of God that's being shook. He's that representative that what he's doing is representative of Babylon throughout all of scripture and is representative of every evil kingdom that has ever ruled on this earth. And again, it's a reminder and a picture of who we were before Christ as well. And here we have Nebuchadnezzar as a reflection of the dominion God gave to humankind, but he's doing it in a way that's not right. Because at the end of the day, all of us want God's blessing we have a desire even if we're not recognizing the true God people that don't know the true God there's this desire to have the blessings of God to have the promises of God but what happens with us as man is we always try to get it our own way apart from God Adam and Eve what was the what was the temptation for Eve did God really say that you would die if you eat this tree if you eat this fruit you will be like God Wow, so God told me to do, to eat wherever I want, just don't eat from this tree. But you know what? I think I, you know what? I think I could achieve this relationship with God in a totally different way. I can do things my way apart from you guys, so <laughs> I eat it. And then what happens is we fall into sin, we fall into disobedience, and the consequences come in. And this is what happens to, to mankind as a whole. This is what King Nebuchadnezzar is doing is I'm going to achieve God's blessings apart from him. And so his story is a representative of every kingdom. It says that he uh, takes, he goes into, let me, let me go back to Je Daniel chapter two, okay? So we have here, remember the story of Babylon, the Tower of Babel, okay? Genesis chapter 11, it's man trying to build a tower, man trying to make a name for theirself. At the end of the day, it was a pursuit to gain God's blessing and favor on their own. We don't need God. And God confuses them. God mixes them. God causes that confusion to humble them and say, this is not how you get my blessing. This is not how you get the promises. You can't get them apart from me. And this is what the book of Daniel wants us to see. He wants King Nebuchadnezzar to know that you can't understand 
that you can't get these promises and these blessings unless you're going to do it with me and my way that I've chosen to reveal that to you. So the statues in the kingdoms are always showing a failed effort by human kings to obtain God's blessing on their own. And if you look at the materials of the image, you start out with the head of gold, then you go down to silver. And as you go down to each further kingdom, the kingdoms are getting inferior in value and they're getting inferior in strength. The more you go down the statue, the metals are weaker until you get to the bottom, which is iron, which is mixed with clay, which is brittle, which is gonna be able to crumble. And so what's going on? What is, what is God telling Nebuchadnezzar? That look, Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom might be big, but every kingdom of earth that will come after you is going to be weaker and it's gonna be more chaotic and it's going to be quicker to crumble. That man's efforts on its own to obtain the blessing are never going to achieve it. It's gonna get worse and worse until finally God does something about it to put a stop to men's efforts trying to establish this kingdom of God on their own. It'll never happen with man. And so there's some possible, when people look at the statue, they say, what do these, what do these kingdoms represent? What real life countries are they really pointing to? And so there's three different scenarios. Some people might be able to point out more. But in one scenario, they say the head of gold is Babylon. They say the chest of silver is Persia. They say the lower body bronze is probably Greece. And the feet of clay mixed with iron is probably Syria. And the fifth kingdom is the kingdom of God. Second way to look at the different countries that make up the statues, the head of, go of gold is Babylon. The chest of silver is Medo and the Medes and the Persians. The lower body is possibly Greece, and the clay mixed with iron is probably Rome, and the fifth kingdom is the kingdom of God, okay? And the third way that people say it is it's the head of gold is Babylon, the chest of silver are the Medes, the lower body are the Persians, and the feet and clay mixed with iron is Greece, and the fifth kingdom is God. Now, do we know 100% which represents which? The issue you have is if you try to take a Greece as the fourth kingdom or you take a Rome as the fourth kingdom, there's just some things that don't line up with Jesus' coming, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. And so at the end of the day, it's not important to understand what the text is saying. That at the end of the day, what the text is saying is not the point of who those countries represent. That's not what we should look at, look out for. It is what is happening to those kingdoms and what God is going to do to those kingdoms that matter. And so there's speculation on all sides. I would probably say it's probably Greece is mixed in there with Syria and the Persians and Babylon. But at the end of the day, it doesn't change what God is doing in the world and what God has done in the world. And John Silheimer, in a book that I was reading, and I would agree with him that this, is that all the kingdoms grow worse and worse. And this is the point. The statue shows us all kingdoms grow worse and worse until Christ comes to restore it and establish his kingdom. So what the countries are, it's up to debate. But what's not up to debate is that man will fail until God does something about it, until God shows up and establishes his kingdom in a new and powerful way. So if you look on the back of that handout that I gave you, I'm not going to take the time to go through this, but I gave this to you. It's taken from John Silheimer's book. And you could look at the different parts where Here's what it said in the vision, and here are the verses and the phrases that tie into the interpretation of the dream. And so it's a really cool table that helps you see, here's what it says about silver, here's the vision of silver, and here's what the interpretation of it means. And you can go through and you can read that. But I want you to look at the very bottom of the left-hand side of the table in bold. It says, the fact that Daniel was able to recount the dream shows that God is revealing these future events and that the interpretation is true. And that's the point that Nebuchadnezzar knew right away. I was told the dream that I had and I was told the interpretation. It has to be true what Daniel is saying. And so you get down to verse 43 in chapter two and it mentions about one of the kingdoms where there is a mixing of the seed and there is this mixture in in this part of the statue. 
And mixing in scripture refers to the idea of intermarrying, marrying somebody of a different uh, nation, of a different class. And so you can even find a reference to that in Ezra 9.2. But then you have the seed of man, and that denotes, or that sign it's, it's talking about a people who are just everyday common people. And they're non-royalty, they're not nobility. So what you see happening in this mixture in the seed of man, it's important why he mentions it, is that this kingdom, these kingdoms, are now marrying with people who are not nobility. And so what happens? The royalty lessens and the kingdom gets weaker and weaker and weaker. Again, this is what God said was going to happen. And so you have a breakdown of kingship and of royalty happening with each of these nations. And this is what the mixture and this is what the seed of man is denoting when we mention it. And Daniel had told him that Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold, but the fifth kingdom is special. And I think it's interesting that it says this fifth, ki this fifth kingdom was cut out of a rock, right? This stone was taken out, and this stone, this rock, crushes the statue, and then that, stat that stone that broke the statue becomes a mountain and fills the whole earth. And that is obviously the kingdom of God. It starts small, but we saw it grows into the, Jesus said this in one of his parables. It's going to start small. It's going to start at the sea, but then it's going to grow. It's going to become this big, huge tree, and it's going to fill the entire earth. It's going to be filled of his glory. And when Jesus finally comes and sets up this kingdom with his death resurrection, he finally defeats all of the human efforts to achieve God's blessings on their own. He finally provides a way once and for all for people to put their faith in him and they can be made right, they can have forgiveness of sins and they can go back to ruling over his world as kings and priests. And then in Revelation 18 too, when Jesus comes and establishes that kingdom, then we get the fallen, fallen is the great Babylon. That this is the moment that God's kingdom has come, he has established it and it will be here forever. And John Silheimer says the last kingdom in the statue will be any kingdom that attempts to carry out God's mandate to have dominion over all creation without relying on God's plan and power. So when we look at who the fourth kingdom is, it's any kingdom that's trying to live on their own apart from God. Verse 45 tells us that it doesn't just say God has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar. How does it describe God there in verse 45? It says, a great God has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar. So what has happened here? We had the clash of King Nebuchadnezzar, the most prideful and powerful person in the world, and we had the true living God who showed himself to be a great God, who has proven himself to be the true living God, a God who dwells with us, a God who cares about the details of our life, and he has shown himself to be true. In verses 46 through 49, as we get ready to close in a few minutes, um, this, is what, this is how King Nebuchadnezzar responds. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, truly your God is a God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. King Nebuchadnezzar has a time of confession and has a time of profession and finally sees, wow, Daniel, your God is the God of gods. He's king of kings. He's the Lord over the world. And right here in this moment, it sets a pattern that we're going to see in Daniel. You have an interpretations of dreams. You have the idea that true God can give wisdom that outshines the wisdom of this world. And the people of God who are about to die can, through prayer, be exalted into power in the world. 
And so the book of Daniel is to be read by people that are living in exile as a, a, a story of hope, as a story of God is in control, as a story of it doesn't matter if you're faced with death, our response should be seek God in prayer, hold firm and fast that he is the true living God and that we will never worship anybody else but him. But here it's also a story for us to see that, man, the beauty of it all is that none of us can obtain God's blessings in our own efforts. But God has chosen to give us his promises, to give us his blessings, if we respond to him in faith. And this is a message of hope. I mean, how many people do you know in your circle of influence, in your world, where people are trying to achieve good standing with God on their own? Do you know a lot of those people? No? You don't know a lot? There's a lot of people who feel like they have to earn, earn their way, to earn God's grace, where they're living in a world where it's like, I got to make sure that I'm doing good things throughout the week so my good deeds outweigh my bad. So at the end of the day, the balances will favor me in the good and that I don't have it the opposite way because then I'll go to hell. And our world operates in this way where they're trying to earn it and what ends up happening, they're exhausted, their lives are chaotic, their lives are frustrated, sin is prevalent in their life because they're trying to obtain the blessing outside of God's ways of doing it. But God is not sitting back and silent. He says, I'm going to show my people the way to me, the way to my promises, and the way to my blessings. And we see that greatest fulfillment of that in Jesus Christ. That he came, God himself, took on human flesh, became like us, so that he could live the life that we could never live, that he remained obedient even to the point of death, gave his life on that cross, and through his death and God raising him back to life, we see that there is our hope, that the world is going to be put right one day, through faith in him we're put right, and one day we're going to sit back and have everything restored, and it'll return to the way that God had wanted it to be from the beginning. But God had a plan. God is orchestrating it. He's ordering it. And the reality is that we're going to see as we get into the next few chapters is that man cannot stop God's plans. God is always more powerful. And no matter how much man thinks he's in charge, God shows them. In the very next chapter, we see King Nebuchadnezzar, God, you are king, you are Lord of lords get to chapter 3, I don't know how much time has gone on, but you immediately see the humility that King Nebuchadnezzar had here is gone. And the pride returns. And we'll see how God responds to that next week. So before we end tonight, I want to open it up for any questions or comments or things you sit back and say, you know, whatever. I want to open up and give you some time to engage I absolutely do think God gave him the dream as the opportunity because for us to know about God, God has to reveal himself. And this dream led to this revelation about who God really is, the God of Israel. So I do believe God gave him that dream so that he could also tell them the truth about himself. It's a good question. Yep. So if you can't hear in the back what he said, he was saying that um, it's interesting that the king, he had his own 
wise men and all these things to interpret. But he had to go to a Jewish slave in order to find the interpretation of the dream and go to that Jewish slave's God to finally have the answer. And so that's absolutely right. And that's what that's the idea of the kingdom of man versus the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God is always greater than the kingdom of man. And this is what the big clash is, and it reaches a big crescendo in the next chapter as well, where we see King Nebuchadnezzar makes a huge declaration about how great he is and how small God is. Um, so that's, that's a good thought. Anyone else have any questions or thoughts or comments or things you want to add? Don't be shy, because I can learn from you all too. Trust me. No, I think I think we all would admit, even as Christians, we still have those moments. Like, I saw those moments where my pride gets in the way. All right, God, I got this. I can do this. And sometimes it's not, it doesn't even have to be flat out, oh, God, I don't believe in you. It's, you know, hey, I'm going to operate in my own strength. I got this. I don't need to spend time in prayer about this. We're going we're gonna to do ministry, and we're going to force it our way. We're going to, here's the next 10 strategies we're going to implement next week. And we're going to make sure that people are changed now. And God's like, hello, it's through my spirit. All change comes through me. It's through my might, through my power, my strength, not yours. And so I think you're right. I think it's even for us, we still go through that. I do it. And it's easy for us because we're, pff, that sin in our life makes us constantly go against God. Any other comments, questions? Please ask, add. Yes. No, that's a good thought. I like it. I think it's your your position and the higher up you are does not matter when it comes to the things of this world. It doesn't matter how much power you have. If you're doing it apart from God, it means nothing, right? And Jesus even said that to his disciples. Apart from me, you can do what? You can do nothing. Zip, zada, nada. And you're right. The most powerful king has to go to people beneath him. And it still didn't work out for him. He had to go to somebody who got the answer from God. So that's good. Good thought. Anything else? Anything else? Well, w next week we're going to tackle chapter 3 and however far we can get. And so um, some of this stuff it takes a little longer because we've got to build and set the foundation. But now we're going to get into some stories that will kind of accelerate and kind of see this all playing out on a bigger grand scale. And so the goal is to try to get through chapter seven by the end of this month. Whether or not that happens, not sure, but we're gonna try our best to get through chapter seven and then later in the year, come back to chapters eight through 12 and finish the book of Daniel. Let me pray for you guys tonight. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the true living God. We thank you that you care about what happens to us as your creation. Father, we're created in your image and you have chosen to love us despite our rebellion, despite our sin, despite our pride. And Father, we thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to restore us, to make us new so that we could be the people that you have meant for us to be. And Father, I pray today that we would take to heart Daniel's example, Father, where he remained in prayer to you, where he sought his answers in life from you where he relied upon you. And Father, you teach your faithful people that if you want to survive in Babylon, if you want to survive in a country that is opposed to you, that it's bathed in prayer and we hold firm to our convictions and trust you no matter what the world throws at us. Watch over each person that's here tonight. Bless their family. Guard their hearts and minds in your son Jesus and bring us back next week to dive into more of your word. It's in your name we pray. Amen.